Thank you so much for joining. Really excited to have you here today. I'm Erica Stacey from Scout Digital Training. I am a big fan of Google Analytics as part of all things digital marketing. And I'm really excited to have a chat to you today about a very specific way you can use Google Analytics to better understand and improve the landing pages of your website. So we're going to be chatting for around about an hour. Uh, we'll see how we go. Hopefully this will be a little bit more of a, of a shorter condensed topic as um, some of you would know I do have a habit of going on about this stuff a bit. But hopefully it is useful. Uh, so some of you have found the chat box on the right hand side. Feel free to have a conversation in there. However, if you, if you do have any specific questions for me, it would be really helpful to use the question section. Uh, should appear at the base of your screen. So you can type in a question there. Um, it'll give me a notification and a list of questions that I can go through and answer as we go if they're going to tie in with a section that we're up to, or I'll cover them off at the end as well. So there were some comments last time, last time I did a webinar about not seeing my face all nice and big. So I'll give you a hi, <laughs> quick hello before going back down. Um, I also mentioned that I had only recently moved office and um, it hasn't actually gotten that much more organized since last month, which is a bit scary. It's been very busy. Very, very busy month. So, uh, welcome everyone. Got some more people introducing. So, lovely to have you all here. Um, now, I'm going to be running through these examples showing the Google Analytics from my website. So, you might want to try and follow along with your own at the same time, or this session is being recorded and you will automatically receive a link to view the replay. Uh, usually comes out within an hour or two after the live broadcast. So if you do want to go through this exercise on your own afterwards, um, where you can stop and start the video as you go, then that would be helpful as well. And I do have some slides at the end that I'll run through that'll just recap the different reports that we're gonna have a look through. Um, now this exercise is also really helpful to do with either a text document open on your screen that you can pop some notes in, or a good old fashioned piece of paper and pen. Uh, but you can, you can write down some key pages to focus on because what we're going to be looking at is um, trying to identify landing pages that might not be performing as well as they could be. Um, and then looking at a few options on how you can potentially improve them, which is going to be very unique to each specific website as well. Cool. So first of all, just want to clarify what landing pages are. Um, I, are. I am using the term landing pages based on the Google Analytics definition, which is the page that a visitor enters or lands on your website. So that's where the, the first experience they have, the first page they see on your website. So not the landing pages, which might be used for campaigns, where you might create a very specific campaign landing page where you're driving advertising traffic or sign up traffic or that type of thing. We're actually talking about your general everyday website. Um, however many pages it has, uh, people can land on any page of that website, um, providing it's not hidden or part of a process that they need to go through. So typically it can be a home page for a lot of websites. The home page is still the most visited landing page, uh, most visited page and often the most visited landing page, the page where people um, arrive on the website. Uh, but because any page of your website can be indexed by search engines and we use, you know, email marketing and advertising and social media to share our pages, um, our internal pages, people could actually be landing on your, on any page of your website. So we're all kind of focusing on that first impression. Um, we do want, you know, we want people to have a great experience on our website. We want them to hopefully stay on our website, but most importantly, we want them to, to do the thing that we want them to do on the website. And again, that's going to vary. So that might just be getting some information. It might be contacting you. It might be signing up or subscribing for something. Um, it might be making a purchase, registering for something. There's all sorts of things people can do on our website. So often we refer to them as, as conversions if we're tracking them. So, but not every single visitor is going to do this as well. So this is not always a bad thing. 
I do it, I'm sure you do it as well. We all visit websites. We don't buy every single time we visit a website. Sometimes we'll research and do bits and pieces. There are certain websites that we'll visit quite regularly. So I'll just make mention of a few things to look out for as we go on um, through this as well. So I'll jump over to my screen share here. Cool, so you should be able to see my Google Analytics at the moment. Uh, this is, is just the home screen. Um, I've cherry picked a few specific reports that I find most effective for understanding that first impression or those landing page experiences on your website. So we're gonna jump down into that. Um, most of these you'll find within the behavior section. So we're looking in the report section. Real time is what's happening on your site right now. Audience is all about who is on your website. Acquisition is all about how they came to be on your website and behavior is the what. So what they're actually looking at um, and what they're doing on your website as well. Uh, so the first report I wanna have a look at in behavior is one called Behavior Flow. And this is one of the data visualization reports that has been, oh, it's been around for a while but it's still relatively new compared to some of the more, more typical reports that we tend to see. Um, it's really similar to the user flow report that you'll see in, in audience, uh, but in this instance, it's specifically picking the landing page as the default dimension that we're looking at, which is relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, so I would suggest in this case, leaving it on this section. Now, a couple of other things to make mention of before we get too much further. If we're doing a really critical look at our landing pages, we need to consider two things. How long we're looking at, what kind of time frame, and if we're focusing on any specific users as well. So you might have pages that only appear for a short period of time on your website, so we obviously run a lot of events and workshops. Um, those pages exist on our website all year round, but they have, uh, there's going to be a definite um, difference in popularity of those pages at different times of year. So if we wanted to focus on the eight week period leading up to a particular workshop and look at that particular workshop landing page, we might have a um, specific hypothesis in mind, then we would need to make sure that we make that appropriate selection from the menu here. Basically, you want a decent amount of data to be able to make some really informed decisions in regards to your landing pages. Um, if we're just looking at what's happened today or even what's happened over the last week, it might not give us the best understanding. So, you know, two weeks at a minimum, depending on how much traffic you're getting, will give you a bit of an understanding on the flu natural fluctuations that can happen week to week. I'd be suggesting at least 30 days if you're wanting to get an understanding of where you are right now. Or if your site has been running for, for quite a while, you could even go back and go, okay, I want to have a look at how all of my landing pages have been performing um, to the, for the calendar year so far or even the whole year so far. So we want a kind of big, big, nice chunk of data to deal with here. So that's something you're going to have to consider is, is what time frame you're looking at here. Um, the other thing is actually focusing on the most important or most relevant users to our website, specifically in regard to something like location. So as I always say, websites are part of the World Wide Web, we, you know, the global internet, and that does tend to attract visitors from all over the world as well. So some of them might get there because they are genuinely interested, some of them might get there by mistake, some of them might be pesky referral spam, there's all sorts of reasons why we might get people from all over our site. And if we have a very specific local product or local service, looking at all of the information that we have available for all users might not be giving us the best understanding of how our most important visitors who potentially could be taking that next step and doing the thing on our website could be um, engaging with our site and get a little bit blurred. So the best way to manage that is through adding a segment. So you'll see by default, we're looking at 100% sessions, all users. These segments aren't actually, the kind of location segments I'm talking about 
aren't actually um, in the system segments. They aren't standard Google Analytics uh, segments by default. Um, they are custom segments that you would need to create here. So I've got some that are set up for Adelaide visitors and South Australian visitors. Um, if I've got some time at the end, I'll tap back into making segments. Otherwise, perhaps that's something we can have a look at at a different time. So, so I'm actually going to focus. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off all users. I only want to focus on Australian visitors. Here we go. So I'm just looking at Australian visitors. To be honest, I should probably be looking at South Australian visitors because we do definitely have that more South Australian focus in what it is that we do. Um, but for the purpose of this example, we're looking at uh, the year to date, so almost six months worth of data um, and looking at our Australian visitors as well. So this behaviour flow diagram just gives us a bit of a general understanding about how people are moving through our website and where they're potentially dropping off on our website as well. So we've got our landing page here, um, which is how people are, are first entering the website and then how they're actually moving through the website as well. So all I do at this point, I actually focus on the starting pages column, is just have a bit of a look down at what pages um, people are landing on most often on the website and then where these drop-offs are occurring. So it'll show us what percentage of traffic actually drops off from that page. Um, now, because we're looking at the URLs here, this is everything that comes after your domain. So the forward slash indicates our homepage. In our case, we've got scoutdigitaltraining.com.au. There's nothing that comes after that uh, domain in the URL, so it's the forward slash. So this would be quite typical for a lot of websites that a lot of that have a lot of visitors who start off on their homepage. So we can see here that 51% of traffic is going through onto a second page, about half, but there's half, less than half, just under half, that are actually dropping off. So like we know, not everyone stays on our page the whole time and on our website the whole time, but particularly for something like a home page. Having a high bounce rate, a high exit rate, a high drop off rate is a bit of a concern. This is always terrifying when I'm doing these demos with my own data as well. So all I would do at this point is just start to note down which pages are appearing in your kind of top three. So we've, for, in my instance, I've got the home page, we've got the podcast page. There's a little bit of traffic that goes through, but a lot that drops off. Again, this is one of those things that can be quite typical with things like podcasts and blog posts. People come there, they get the information they need and they leave, but it's still worth jotting down that this is a page that could potentially do some work. Um, we've also got, we've got a specific um, event that got a lot of traffic. Uh, it was relevant for a very specific point of time. So if I wanted to do more of that um, specific product or event or service page analysis, that's one I could focus on. And then I've got uh, general events if I wanted to kind of jump down to, to give myself three general pages. Um, the general events page as well, there's a bit of through traffic there, but quite a bit of drop off. So a lot of opportunity. And at this point, all I'd be doing is just jotting down those kind of top three or four pages that are appearing in your starting pages that seem to have a pretty high portion of drop offs as well. So just a quick look there before we get going. Okay, the next report we're going to go to is in site content and it's all pages. So these are all of the pages on your website that have views on them ordered by default by page views. So this will be quite similar again to what we have seen on that behavior flow. Got the home page is the most visited page. These aren't landing pages, just keep in mind, these are all pages. So this, these pages could have been viewed at any point during the uh, browsing experience. Um, though we do have an indication here on the number of entrances and the exit rate as well. So we've got home page, we've got events, we've got a couple of specific events in there as well. We've got some categories, um, a blog post, uh, contact form. And if you wanted to actually look down even further, you could expand that table here. Because like I said, if we, if we wanted to do a general analysis of our website, I'd be focusing on kind of the top two to maybe five, depending on how much time you've gone, two to five general pages. So not event specific, not blog post specific, not product specific. 
So in my case, again, it'll be the home page, the events page, um, the contact page, the about page, and maybe the podcast page as well if I wanted to pick five. So first of all, we're just wanting to identify those most popular pages. Um, another little tip that you can do with these, uh, this kind of analysis is getting that understanding of, you know, based on which pages are most popular and people tend to view a lot on your website, make sure that they're really clearly displayed in your navigation. So even looking at those main sections, having your primary navigation really clearly ordered from left to right with those or top to bottom, depending on how it's configured with those main pages can actually encourage you to get a little bit more traffic to those pages as well, because we're making it super, super easy for people to find them. They're obviously um, popular, people are obviously interested in them. So let's not make them hunt around for them as well. Okay, so we just want to note those top kind of pages that we're exploring. And then concentrate on these two columns here, bounce rate and exit rate. So again, we're not looking at landing pages specifically yet, um, but we want to get a bit of an understanding about which pages do tend to have a bit of a higher bounce rate or more people are more likely to leave our website from that particular page. Now, people do leave websites and pages all the time for all sorts of different reasons. Um, Unfortunately, no one's ever going to keep our website open and be continuously browsing the entire time and every single day. Uh, but what we're looking for here are pages where we would expect people to stay on there a bit longer or want them to, or particularly where, you know, and often when we are talking about um, pages like landing pages, uh, they are pages where we want people to continue on to somewhere else within our website. So a home page, we would expect people to land on the page. You can see here that so even though it had a high number of drop-offs, it's got a very low, showing quite a low bounce rate and low exit rate here. Um, still could be better if someone lands on your homepage. There's a lot of information on our homepage. People can actually get a lot of information about um, dates and details just from the homepage without clicking any further. But ideally, when you have someone's landing on your homepage, you want to know that they're taking that next step. They're in the right place. They've gone on to look at your products or your services or read your posts or those types of things. Um, other pages, on the other hand, can often typically have a high bounce rate and things like blog posts, difficult to um, discern mine, but this one in position number nine, this is a really popular blog post of mine. It's an old post. It's about five years old. It still gets a huge amount of traffic. People spend a long time on the page actually reading the information, um, but they do often leave from that point as well. It's a, it's a how-to step-by-step kind of page. People get the information. Um, there's a bit of optimization I've done on that page with uh, linking to related articles and those types of things. Uh, but that page for me continues to be a real challenge because people got the information they wanted to and, and have left, which is good in some ways. And there's some other techniques I can suggest to help people uh, return back to your website afterwards as well. So blog posts can often have high bounce rates. Um, contact us pages can sometimes have high bounce rates. Uh, people come to the contact page, they get the address, they get the phone number, they get the information that they need and then they leave. It's not necessarily a bad thing. If you do have a form that takes them through to another page, then you would expect that to be a little bit lower as well. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, you know, podcast pages kind of fall into a similar area as blog posts as well. So we're going to kind of ignore those pages in this example and focus on, on these pages. So home page, it's not a terribly high bounce rate or exit rate, but we, you know, it could be better. Um, the events page, it's obviously a bit of a bounce rate and we saw from the behavior flow, there's a few drop-offs happening from there. And that's a list of all of our events. So we'd want people to continue on further. Um, contact us page, I'm going to ignore that one because um, I know people often getting the information that they're after. Um, about page is looking pretty good and podcast page. So I kind of look for anything that's kind of 70% and above for a bounce rate um, and, and, you know, compare it back to your behavior flow list, jot those ones down again, those kind of like top three, two or three, maybe five pages, which feel like they're not performing as well as they possibly could be. So that's our site content, all pages. Now we're going to jump into our landing pages.
So we've got a bit of a, this has all been about warming us up and getting a bit of a general feel for what pages people are looking at most often on our site, how people are moving through. Now, when we're looking at the landing page report, these are the pages that people are actually landing, entering our site on and having that very first experience with our site. So we should have a pretty good idea of what these are going to be so far based on the um, a couple of reports we've looked at so far. So again, I've still got the home page. I've got a couple of specific, very popular events. I've got that blog post. I've got the events page in there as well. And I'm just going to expand my table to see the... Okay, so the podcast page, while it actually gets a lot of views, is actually quite low in regards to being a landing page with the first time somebody enters the website. So again, that's another one I could kind of pay attention to in regards to, okay, how can I improve? You know, the people who do get there are obviously interested in this page. How can I improve that and then get them staying on there as well? And there's a couple of things we want to have a look at <coughs> here. So again, let's have um, uh, a look through that bounce rate and really try and pinpoint anything that is looking higher than you expect or quite high as well. So kind of about 70 to 80 percent or, you know, certain pages like home page, events pages, product pages, you want people, move, they should be moving through those kind of pages. So you really want that bounce rate to be as low as possible. And um, the other thing you can do at this point in time as well is if you are tracking any goals on your website, just have a bit of a look for uh, where those goal completions are occurring based on how people are entering your website as well. So if you are tending to get a high conversion rate from people landing on a particular page, um, that's good. <laughs> but we want to be improving, improving that as much as possible. So if we can encourage that flow through, we're going to have a better chance of getting more people to, to convert there. So we really want to focus kind of on those top few pages. So hopefully you've either written them down in that text document um, or just on a notepad and paper as well. Then we're just going to analyse them a little bit further. So I'm going to take my home page for a start. So if you click on any of these links, it'll take, it'll isolate that page in the report. So it'll just show us that one page. And we can have a bit of a play around with secondary dimensions, which I think I've mentioned before. So most of these, these tables all by default just show us data based on one dimension. So we're looking at landing pages here and we're looking specifically at the home page. But we can slice and dice this up by adding another dimension as well. The two that I would recommend looking at our default channel grouping. You can actually scroll through all of these or display as an alphabetical list or just search and click on that one. Default channel grouping is the, the, the traffic source that people have used to enter your website. So this is a really good way of understanding um, not just this is the page that people landed on, but this is the page that people landed on from one of these very particular traffic sources because not all traffic sources are created equal. And this is going to then create some very different results here in regards to the behaviour and engagement with the page as well. So we've got to be careful when we look at these big overall numbers like bounce rate. Um, even, I mean, I do look at bounce rate in the audience overview report, but I know that digging deeper, I'm going to get a better understanding of which um, audiences are tending to bounce off more. So we can already see here, that compared to the average for that view, 31.9, um, those who come from organic search, uh, it, the bounce rate is slightly lower, which is positive, and that's also a channel which is contributing to a lot more goal completions on the, on the site as well, and engagement with the site seems quite healthy. There's a bit of a higher bounce rate from direct and email. Um, social actually has a much lower than average bounce rate, even though there's less time on site and less goal completions. Paid search has quite a high bounce rate, so it might indicate some not very appropriate targeting on the pay, on the on those ads. Um, I'm actually trying to consider what that would be now because typically I don't link to the to the home page uh, from paid search ads. I'll actually um, link through to a, well, what I recommend is linking through to the specific uh, product or service page that you're actually promoting. So while that is typical, and we are looking at a small number of sessions here, 
Um, that's something to keep in mind, which would be skewing that up as well. Um, we've got other, the helpful other, uh, and we could delve deeper into the source and medium to figure out where that's been allocated from. Um, I do find it often comes from uh, Facebook ads, can sometimes contribute to that other, depending on how it's been tagged, um, and referrals, so links that have come from other websites as well. So that's just one way of kind of going through and going, okay, the whole page might not be broken, it might be the traffic that's coming from one particular traffic source that is having a poor experience. So you can try and understand why that is. Um, you know, for something like paid search, and maybe we have some ads that are going to the home page and that's not an appropriate page for them to be linking through. Let's update that because they're gonna have a better experience if they go through to the page that has all the information and not have to scroll and find it. Um, and also look for areas where you can improve as well. Uh, just going to pick up on Nick's question. There is a way to break down other. Um, not easily in this report. It would be a case of kind of backtracking and having a look in the acquisition section. You can click on other if it appears in your default channel grouping and that will take you to a deeper report which will show you that source and medium combination uh, with what actually makes up that other. And typically those will have some recognisable um, dimensions in there that you'd be able to then figure out okay that's actually social traffic that's paid social that's blah 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 blah, blah. Um, but in this instance we're just looking at the general default channel groupings uh, okay so that's that's one way i'd recommend analyzing each of those individual pages so we've identified our kind of top two to five pages of concern we've noted them down but then we're going to go through and go, okay, is it all traffic to that page or is it traffic from a particular page source that might be having some issue there that we need to fix up? The other dimension, secondary dimension, that I recommend analysing these pages by is device category. So this is going to show you the breakdown of um, which device, desktop, mobile or tablet, people used um, to visit your website from. And this can be really helpful because again, not all devices are created equal. We have different experiences on them, particularly if you have a mobile responsive website. So it's good to be able to understand firstly, what percentage of traffic is coming from each of those different devices and then how that might potentially be impacting things like bounce rate, pages per session and average session duration. Those kind of engagement metrics and those overall conversions as well. And these are going to vary for different sites. Um, now, typically, I do find bounce rate tends to be slightly higher on mobiles. People tend to be very action oriented on mobiles. They won't keep 100 tabs open while they're working and flick back and forth between them all. We usually go, you know, go to our phones, go to our browser, open it up, find a website, have a read, close it, go back. They're often very short um, experiences. Even if people are scrolling through social, on their mobile and they open up a link to um, a blog post or a landing page or a product page in their browser it can be really tricky to get them to stay on your website because they're using that browser that in-app browser and having a look at your content during their facebook time or their twitter time or their instagram time so they are much more likely to go back to scrolling through that social channel then completely forget that and, and stay on your website as well. So, so mobile and social traffic can often tend to have higher bounce rates, lower pages per session, average session duration. That is quite typical, but you don't want them to, to see them being dramatically different as well. Like if this mobile happened to have a not, you know, 70, 80, 90% bounce rate, um, average of one pages per session and 10 seconds average session duration, I'd be very concerned. Um, that would indicate if there was that big discrepancy that there might be a real problem with that mobile version of the landing page that needs to be um, considered and had a look at as well. Um, and then, you know, similar with tablet as well. I don't tend to have a lot of, a lot of traffic from tablet, but it's that same analysis you take with, with each of them. So is there one device category that seems to be dramatically different to the others? And because we are focusing on a specific page here, make sure you actually use those devices and go to the pages 
and browse through those pages as well. So what does the page actually look like on a mobile? What does it actually look like on a tablet? How does it perform? And there's some mobile friendly tests that you can do as well that advise you if you don't have enough space around buttons and those types of things that are likely to keep people flowing through the website as well. So something really important to keep in mind there. Often as, as um, webmasters, we manage our websites from the desktop version. So we're most familiar with the desktop, but there are a lot of people browsing on mobile devices. So I'm not gonna go through all of those top pages for me, but this is a process that I would suggest doing for any of those pages that you have identified. Going through, looking on them more specifically, looking at the default channel grouping, looking at the device category, and trying to figure out if potentially it's traffic from a particular traffic source or from a particular device that is tending to have the um, worst experience on your website. Or if they're all kind of around about the same, it might seem, you know, from a website and user experience perspective, the website might be okay, but there could still be some ways that you can improve all of those versions to keep people flowing through your website as well. So make sure you're jotting all of these observations down as you go. The other thing that can sometimes impact that first impression that people have with our websites and the, that landing page experience is the site speed. So how long your website is actually taking to load. And in the behavior section, there is this site speed section where we'll get a bit of an overview. And it, so Google Analytics randomly does um, page load checks throughout the month. I remember we're looking at quite a large period here. So you can get a bit of an understanding on approximately how long each of your pages takes to load and a bit of a breakdown down here as well. You'll see sometimes you might have a big peak. Um, you don't want them to happen too often, but they're obviously not good when they do, where it might be worth looking into, was there like, was the server down? Did you have an issue with your hosting or your website server or your bandwidth? Was there a lot of traffic going through there on that particular day? Is there something that might have contributed to that? Or was it a bit of, bit of an, an anomaly? But specifically what we're gonna have a look at with landing pages is page timings. So here we have our average page load time, which to be honest is still much higher than what I would like, but we're doing what we can. Um, and we wanna try and identify those pages that might have uh, longer than average page load times, particularly if they match up with some of those pages that we've identified as being important landing pages to us. So that events page, probably should have actually looked at that in that last example because I could have gotten some good insights. I'll do that afterwards. Um, that events page is actually taking a lot longer to load than average and could potentially be responsible for that high bounce rate on that page. People just get bored and sick of waiting for it to load and they jump off. So again, in your notes, you wanna make note if any of those core pages that you've identified have actually um, got slow page load times as well. And then you can even go down into the speed suggestions area. So Google Analytics now interacts with Google's page speed insights tool, and it will give you some suggestions on what you can actually do to improve the um, speed of, of those particular pages. This happened to me last week in a training workshop and it made me laugh that actually trying to click on the speed suggestion section of Google Analytics takes a really long time to load. Um, so we might not be able to show that, but if you are more patient than me and can, um, can get it to load, oh, here we go. So you'll see it, it will actually um, give you an, un an understanding of what kind of suggestions there are and you can open that up to here we go. It's just going to analyze the page again and it'll give you a list of things you can do. Um, there are certain things that you will be able to control easily. So it will often identify large images and large videos that are slowing down the page, give you specific file names that you can go and identify and improve the size of those. Some of them might be more website build or coding related where it's combining or minifying files, which you might need to um, you could you know, copy and paste or screenshot and send them to your developer to have that discussion about whether or not it's something that can be done on your site. Um, site speed's a really tricky thing because there's so many variables in regards to it. 
I always hate to read these demos do when they look so bad. Um, and this will also, it'll give you the page speed insights both on desktop and mobile as well. So if you know you tend to have more visitors from desktop or mobile, you can have a look at those. Um, but you'll see here it gives you uh, some, some opportunities with what you could do, which would could potentially save, save some time through here as well when you've got time to go and do all of that. Uh, so jot those down on your list as well of things that you can do in regards to site speed. So we've done lots of analysing and identified some pages that might potentially have some landing page issues. The optimising part is still going to take a little bit of uh, very careful guesstimation. So going back, looking at our pages on our website, looking at them from those different devices and trying to understand uh, what might potentially be putting people off or what things we could test because this is going to be a big testing um, uh, there's going to be some testing involved with this as well um, now i also use the here we go the chrome um, google analytics plugin google analytics extension it's only available for chrome being a google product uh, but it does give you a bit of information about where, what links people are clicking on, on your particular page. So Google Analytics used to have uh, this page insights report within Google Analytics that got removed quite a number of years ago. Uh, but this is a way of getting a bit of an understanding about where clicks are happening on your page as well, because Google Analytics by itself generally shows us how people are flowing through the website. Sorry, sorry, no. How, uh, which pages people are looking at on the website in total, not specifically what they're doing on each page unless we've set up things like event tracking. So we don't always know where people are clicking, but this little plugin can give us a bit of an understanding on what people seem to be most interested in. And just keep in mind, these are actually the total percentage of clicks on all of the links on that, on the particular page we're looking at that link through to that next page. So. As we can see with About Us, for example, uh, there are three more page links on this page to About, which in total is getting 25 um, clicks in this uh, what period. We're looking at the last 30 days now, back to the last 30 days. So you can change that time period here as well. So it doesn't necessarily tell us which of the About Us links people are actually have actually clicked on. It's just all of those that have gone through. So we can get an understanding of if we're analysing you know, our home page as a landing page, which um, information are people most interested in and most likely to click through? Another tool that you can use to do this a little bit better though, in some ways, so I do love Google Analytics, but it does have its limitations as well, is actually um, using a uh, heat mapping and visitor recording tool, something like Hotjar, which has a free version as well. So you can actually um, just bring my slides back up here so I can show you. Uh, so you can actually set up particular pages and have Hotjar track heat maps for you based on clicking and moving and scrolling on a particular page. And this can be on, uh, can look at desktop interactions, mobile and tablet as well. So this is just looking at the desktop version. And this will, um, so this is something where if you've identified some landing pages that might have some issues, um, you can't figure out if it's a, a page speed issue, you're not really sure what the problem is. This is another really great way of analysing your pages to kind of go, well, what are people actually looking at um, and clicking at on this page as well? Are they even scrolling down and looking at, you know, the stuff down below or is the page just too long and nobody's even getting down to the bottom? of the page. So something to play around with there. Another very cool thing you can do with Hotjar is actually record visitor sessions on your website as well. And I find this super useful for those, um, you can put some parameters around what you're going to record uh, and those types of things, um, but it will record all of those engagements on your website even if it's only a one page visit and you can see how long that visit is as well. So for anybody who's been working with Google Analytics for a while, you would know that because Google Analytics re re relies on clicks between pages to count how long someone's been on a page, 
we actually don't have a time limit for how long people have been on a single page session, which is also referred to as a bounce visit. So bounced visits will always show zero time on site, which can affect the overall um, uh, metrics that you're looking at. But here we can see this was a one page visit on the home page, but they spent over six and a half minutes on the home page. So I could watch that recording and see what that person was actually doing on the home page. Were they scrolling down and reading everything? Did they just leave it open? What was it that they actually did? And you've got, got that recording there as well. Um, it'll also show you, like I said, record desktop, tablet and mobile. So you can get, actually put yourself in the scenario of um, someone on that device to understand, you know, and I've watched some that take a long time to load and it's painful to watch the page loading. Um, but it, it makes you see, okay, this person probably didn't have a great experience. That's something I could actually, actually fix up. It's also got some other, um, I haven't used them very much, uh, but it's got um, polls and survey functionality as well. So there are some tools like this that will actually allow you to create little polls on your websites, um, you know, integrate live chat and just ask people what kind of experience they're having with your site as well, if they found what they're looking for, um, if they found it easy to navigate, those types of things, because there's, you know, there's a bit that we can get from data, but uh, there's some more um, tools and insights that we can use as well to really understand why our pages might not actually be performing that well. So once you've identified what those pages are, like I said, here's a kind of a recap of what we've looked at. So with something like um, behaviour flow, uh, I recommend focusing on those top three landing pages where those drop-offs tend to be occurring. Um, then that all pages to get an understanding of what the most popular pages are. Uh, the landing pages, so focusing on those key pages that might have quite a high bounce rate and you can use those secondary dimensions, so the default channel grouping um, or the device category um, to understand the experience that people might be having. Um, and then potentially look at, look at site speed as well. So consider those page timings and whether or not speed could be a factor in that landing page experience as well. Um, I just want to jump back to my, uh, is this going to let me, here we go. Jump back to my screen here. Let's close this one down. Um, but this is going to take a little bit of just general time as well. So you need to, once you've identified those pages, have a look through them, have a look really critically, not with our rose coloured glasses of this is our website and it's so amazing. Ask other people that you know to go and visit the pages and tell, tell from different devices um, and tell you what they think. You know, we notice the event page on our website actually has a high number of bounces and as a landing page it has a high number of bounces it actually gives no information there's no introduction that says these are all the public workshops we offer have a look below blah 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 it just goes bang here you go and people are up to you know they have to scroll through themselves yeah i'm being quite critical here i know there are some issues um, we're trying to incorporate more more dates on here so people can understand um, we don't know you know, and the, and the durations, so people have that information straight up. So these are those little kind of um, uh, insights that you need to seek to kind of go, well, what is it? You know, why might people potentially be leaving this page? Is it just because they were looking for a particular workshop that we don't have? Or is there something else that could, um, that we could potentially try and improve and just test it? Unfortunately, a lot of this is, is actually going to be testing it on your particular page. Uh, but there are a few other tools that you can use to try and improve um, the traffic staying on your website as well. I just want to run through those with you quickly. So a couple of possible solutions. Um, you could assess your pages further using something like heat maps or session recordings, like I said um, Hotjar 
could potentially affect that as well. Oh, sorry, could uh, potentially assist with that as well. There are other tools. Um, you might want to consider something like remarketing ads to bring visitors back to your website. So people aren't always going to stay on your website. They might, on you know, and um, particularly if you see them coming from a certain uh, default channel grouping uh, that has a high bounce rate. They have visited your website once. Um, you do have that cookie enabled if it's within your privacy policy and it's part of your marketing, you could be running those remarketing ads on, on the Google Display Network, GDN or Facebook to encourage them to come back, particularly if what you offer is a bit of a like longer purchase cycle uh, product or service or where people might be researching a few different providers before they come back to it as well. It is going to be a case of making incremental changes to pages um, and like I mentioned, giving those time to test the response and review report. So go back and have a, have a look again. Um, you could also use techniques such as uh, if you're wanting to, to retain visitors and get people back to your website, even if that first landing page experience isn't great, um, using things like subscribe forms, like pop-up subscribe forms or slide-in subscribe forms. Uh, so like I mentioned, blog posts and websites with blogs often have a high overall bounce rate because people will regularly come and read the latest blog post and then they leave the latest blog post and they really they leave they might you know if, if one blog post links to another they might read two but people will rarely stay on and read you know 10 20 30 blog posts particularly if they're long in-depth blog posts uh, but having that that subscribe form if, if you're sending out updates whenever you do release new blog posts. It could be a way of you know, getting those regular visitors back to the website and keeping them in your ecosystem. Um, and using things like, like live chat that I mentioned as well. So uh, you could actually, uh, whether it's making use of those polls or something like mentioned in Hotjar, um, or have that live chat available. So we've had that on our website for a while now. And I've just been amazed at how much use it has actually been getting. Um, and it's really great because people who might not be able to find the information that they're looking for on the website, if they can see that someone's there who can answer the question for them, they you know, might be uh, likely to use that as well when you can track those uses. Um, another option you have within uh, Google Analytics is actually running page experiments. So you could do this manually on your pages. Like I mentioned with our events page, we've kind of, you know, I've identified um, some areas where it can definitely be improved and we've started to make those. But if you're really unsure, you could um, make use of uh, the Google Analytics experiments, which uses Google Optimize. It does need about 200 to 300 page views on the target page per month though. So that's just something to keep in mind. You do need a pretty decent amount of traffic to be able to make use of this feature. This is also in the behaviour section down in experiments. Um, I haven't actually played around with it, but I'm looking forward to uh, playing around with it a little bit more. But basically it allows you to create different versions of a particular page and then just test people's responses to it. So a lot of the examples that they often give will things like, um, and some of the things we consider, uh, whether the call to action on a page Will make a difference. So the actual language or term that we're using to try and get people to take that next step. So you know some people might be be put off by the you know buy now, but you know, learn more, subscribe, add to cart, those types of things that take people gradually through the process might make a difference. So it is first going to mean identifying the pages that have the issues and then the areas which you can potentially assist with. But looking at things like calls to action, um, whether or not the colour of a button or the position of a button makes a difference. So you could have two versions of a page going, one that has a green button and one that has an orange button and share your, your traffic. So um, Google Analytics can manage who actually sees those different, port, uh, those different pages and measures all those results that, that occur on there as well. Um, but you do need to identify what objective you have. So the recommended objectives are bounces, page views and session durations. Um, where we are looking to get people to move through our website from a landing page, then bounces could be quite a good one to 
measure because we want people to not bounce off the website um, and go through that next page. So does the call to action, does the button, does the colour, does the position of the button, um, all of these things make, make a difference. So rather than, you know, just jumping in and making that change on the website and then having to wait another one, two, three months to see if it makes a difference, you can create these different variations and versions of your pages as well. So I'm going to have a bit more of a play around with that and I'll let you know what I find from that as well. So where were we? Possible solutions. So yes, but do keep in mind you do need to have, like I mentioned at the start, a decent amount of traffic to be able to um, really analyse these pages appropriately and understand what real experience people are potentially having having on there. Um, okay, so just before I wrap up, I've got a couple of questions here from Nick. So he's asked, um, if, you, if you're using things like lazy load, will that skew the speed times shown? Um, so for those who might not be familiar, uh, lazy load um, loads the content on the page that you're viewing within your screen at the time. Um, and then as you scroll down the page, continues to, to load the rest of the page as well. So similarly to how um, shopping sites with continuous scroll work as well, in, in, in a way, in a way, but it's only loading what's within your screen. Um, to be honest, Nick, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think that it would because uh, Google Analytics does imitate a real user and it would look at what's actually loading within that viewport at that time. Um, but I will look into that and I'll see if I can find more of an answer for you there. Uh, and another question we've got here, um, in Hotjar heat maps, is there a way or alternative software that we can use to create a heat map for a page that always runs without a page view cap and that you can filter by date? Um, again, uh, I I'm not 100% sure, but I can look into it. Um, I did think that Hotjar offered a date filter. Most of them do have page view caps only because um, it affects the different plans that you're on as well. So the, that's one of the ways they get away with having these free plans and getting people in with a free plan is limiting things like the number of page views or needing to refresh them at um, particular times, whereas the... Um, higher level plans do actually you know have much higher limits or no limits as at, at all so the um you know i'm just looking at the business plan for hotjar for example and whereas the basic has up to 2000 daily page views business has up to 20000 daily page views unlimited recordings unlimited heat maps unlimited looks like unlimited everything uh so it would just be a case of having a look at those different um, options that are available. Uh, crazy Orange. Am I getting confused? Crazy Orange, Agent Orange. Uh, there's an orange one as well um, that, that does a similar type thing. They have a free trial but not a free plan. Uh, so yeah, just be a case of looking around. I'll let you know if I find out any more of those as well. Cool. So that was just a little, little look at how you can use Google Analytics to focus on those landing pages, those first impressions of your website try and identify some of the issues that people might potentially be having with your website and then a few ways of uh, kind of like testing and improving those pages or some techniques that you can use to try and get people back to your website as well. You know, understanding that they are going to leave at some point, um, but using things like remarketing ads, subscribe forms could actually get them uh, coming back to your website more regularly um, or, you know, live chat to be having those conversations with them at the time as well. So if anyone is interested in learning more about Google Analytics, we're running some more of these webinars, obviously, and have more resources on the website. Uh, but we do have our Google Analytics Masterclass coming up um, in August. So we've just released all of the workshops for the rest of 2019 on the site. Um, and the Google Analytics Masterclass will be the first one in this last half of the year uh, because it's been a while since we ran it. I think I ran it back in February and I've had been asked by a lot of people since then what, um, when it was coming back. 
Uh, so it's going to run from 9am to 5pm um, at Intersect Co-working Space on Flinders Street in Adelaide. Uh, this is a combination of our previous intro to Google Analytics and further Google Analytics workshops. They were two half-day workshops. So the, the morning session is all about looking at kind of out-of-the-box Google Analytics, understanding what it is, how it works, the basic under, um, overview and reports that it enables. Uh, and then the afternoon is all going into some of the more complex advanced aspects of Google Analytics, where we're looking at the, you know, setting up custom dashboards, event tracking, goal tracking, um, campaign, URL tracking and those types of things as well. Uh, there is an early bird rate available up until two weeks beforehand, which is eight, uh, 18th of July. Then it'll flick over to the regular rate. Um, that includes lunch, morning tea, afternoon tea, coffee, uh, all your training resources, certificate, all sorts of stuff as well. You can check out all the details on the website as well. Um, and you can use as a webinar viewer, uh, where you have a bit of a promo code running at the moment for 20% off um, all bookings made before end of financial year as well. So let me know if there's any questions about that and all the details are on the website. Otherwise, thank you. I can't believe I did that just within an hour. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be about a 45 minute one. Um, but it's always the way. So we'll be running another webinar next month. Um, as usual, if you have any ideas for topics, please feel free to let me know in the comments or contact me via social if there's a topic that you do want to look into. Uh, Google Tag Manager was mentioned last month. So I'm looking at doing a bit of an you know, intro overview of Google Tag Manager. Um, but any other topics that you're interested in, it's always great to know. Otherwise, I'll just keep making up stuff that I find interesting and that I'm doing in Google Analytics as well. So I'm gonna stay on the line for about five minutes. If anybody has any questions, you can either pop them in the question section um, or in the chat section as well, and I can answer any of those questions. Otherwise, I will see you. Yeah. I'll see you next time. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope your tonsils get better, Brianna. That sounds awful. Poor thing. Poor thing. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to hang around here. Feel free to pop any questions in. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys online or in the classroom soon.